George, could you please give us a brief explanation of what happened at the Tinsula Dam back in the 1950s and 60s? Well, uh, to the best of my recollection, I became involved in 1957 when Congress first appropriated money for actual uh, surveys and construction of the Tinsula Dam. And uh, at that time, we went into the federal court in Buffalo uh, asking for an injunction against their coming on a reservation. And uh, they denied our petition and they went ahead with a survey. And then from there on, it seemed like it was uh, still another court action to prevent them from actually constructing the dam. And this all went all the way to the uh, Federal Court of Appeals in Brooklyn. And the federal court there ruled that by appropriating money for the construction of the dam, that it was the wish of Congress to abrogate the Canandaigua Treaty. And uh, we took our appeal to the Supreme Court and they denied uh, they denied our appeal. They didn't hear it at all. And, and so that ended the legal action. And that was followed by uh, uh, congressional action. We went to the uh, Appropriations Committee and tried to stop it there. And later on to the Insular and Interior Affairs Committee and to the Senate committees. And, and it was at that time that we had uh, engaged the service of Dr. Morgan. Actually, the subcommittee on appropriations uh, shelved the Kinzu project until the study was made of the alternative. So uh, they hired an independent firm uh, known as, uh, we called it the TAMS. Tebbets, Abbott, and McCarthy, uh, a firm of engineers. But they were hired by the Corps to do this study as to a comparison of the two plans, the Morgan plan and, and the Corps of Engineer plan. And, and the study showed that uh, Morgan's plan would cost a few million more, but that it would do what Morgan said it would, protect against a greater flood and store more water and wouldn't break our treaty. Was this all Seneca Indian land then? This what was the disagreement about? About the taking of 10,000 acres of our choice bottomland. That was the disagreement. We held that it was protected by the Treaty of Canandaigua. But previous uh, Supreme Court actions had ruled that the United States has the legal right to break any treaty, whether it's with Russia or whether it's with the Seneca Nation or whoever. And the laws of eminent domain extended over every bit of land in this United States, except Embassy Row, probably. And <laughs> what was the reaction of the Seneca Indians back then to the breaking of this treaty? Well, uh, the older people uh, didn't think they would break a treaty. Uh, that the treaty would remain intact. Uh, but the younger ones uh, knew it different. They, they had seen treaties broken among uh, other Indian tribes and that, that wouldn't stand in their way. A mere treaty wouldn't prevent them from building a dam. They could see the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. Besides that, there was a lot of pressure from uh, Pennsylvania on the matter. They, they wanted that dam built to protect against flooding in Pittsburgh and Warren and downstream cities. And they didn't want it to drag on and on, one court action, another. So the main uh, opposition that came from, to, uh, uh, to our proposal came from Senator Clark of Pennsylvania. Um, what did the Senator...
some of these are repetitive, so I just do it a couple times. You ready, Mike? Yep. What did the Seneca Indians do to prevent the dams from happening? Well, uh, first we went into the courts and we and we were turned down there. And then we went into Congress. And not only that, we uh, uh, went to programs like the Today Show and the New York Times uh, uh, writer there, Brooks Atkinson, a critic at large, and the Washington Post and a number of other uh, influential people who were against breaking the treaty. Marlon Brando, uh, Doris Duke Cromwell, uh, Theodore Edison, oh, any number who were, uh, who objected to uh, taking our land. So it wasn't just a regional issue, but it was nationwide back then? People would hear about it across the nation? Absolutely. I received some letters from Australia and, and Germany, and uh, they knew all about it there. It seemed like uh, Eisenhower just returned from Berlin once, and then he accused the accusing the Russians of not keeping their word. And look who's calling the kettle black. And <laughs> what was your role, George? What were you doing during that time? Well, I'm a structural steel worker by by trade, and I'm an iron worker, and. I took time off from that and uh, went to work full time for the Seneca Nation, and it required full time. I was either going to Albany or Washington or a number of other places, Pittsburgh, and then we had a uh, we had a big job on our hands. We had to relocate 145 families. What was the agreement that was reached? between the Seneca Nation and the U.S. government? There was never any agreement reached. Uh, they passed the rehabilitation bill and it was either take it or leave it. Uh, and we couldn't very well leave it. Uh, we, ha we had uh, the, the House of Representatives uh, wanted to pay us much more money but the Senate was different. Uh, there, the, the head of that committee uh, was an old Indian fighter from New Mexico, and he didn't want to give us anything. And, <laughs> and uh, but in in conference, they settled in between there. Uh, we received a 15 million. Uh, the House wanted to give us 29 million. <laughs> but what happened to those families? to those families that you said were unsettled, like the 145 families that were down there? Where did they end up going? Well, we had uh, two areas that we built the two new communities in, but uh, we became urban, urbanized then. Uh, we lived much closer to each other than just like a, like villages. And uh, we didn't have the land for farming like we used to. And, and so it changed our way of life uh, completely. Maybe you could touch on that a little bit more. What kind of effect did the Kinsua Dam have on the people that lived there? Well, especially the older ones. Uh, after all, it was their traditional homeland. And uh, I don't know, it's just uh, they didn't want to lose it because this is where our ancestors lived. This is where they were buried. And, and, and losing our land like that along the river had a strong reaction for them. And uh, the younger ones, it was a different matter. They were going to school in Salamanca and so forth and so on. And they already had relationships with uh, other white students and, uh, but, our elders were the ones that suffered the most. They had a connection to the past from before. Right? Yes. Grandparents. Mm -hmm. Well, they they burned down all the houses, all <laughs> 145 dwellings, and the four churches and the long house and the three general stores and all the reservation schools we had all went up in smoke. And, but uh, 
seems like we should have been inured to something like that. They did the same thing in the Genesee Valley way back in 1779 when, when uh, Sullivan came up there with his so-called punitive expedition. And they burned down our orchards and, and uh, cornfields and everything else. And, and, but that wasn't the end of it. Uh, years later, in, a, in another century yet, when, uh, when they took over the Buffalo Creek Reservation, there's the, there's the smoke there again. They burned all the dwellings off the Buffalo Creek. But here it is, the 20th century, and there's the smoke again. <laughs> They're still, still at the business of burning us out. And uh, it, it had the same message for us as it did then. Lost forever. Move on. <laughs> Move on to where? <laughs> There's no turning back because once it's gone, it's gone. Oh, yes. Um, so the Senecas, they were not pleased with what was going on back then? They, they were not happy with what happened? Here? Oh, no, no. They were, they were, there was much unhappiness. And, uh, and we received a lot of help from the Quakers, uh, the Society of Friends in, in Philadelphia. They, they sent a man down here to uh, help us through our uh, period of relocation and this sort of thing. And he, he had a very strong pen and he wrote a number of articles. And uh, I think one of them was the Kanzu Dam controversy that he wrote. And, he had all the facts there. And it might interest you to know that uh, Theodore Edison took a full page in the New York Times and, and told what was going on there, what was happening to us and of the treaty and what the Corps was doing. So was this the talk for many years then, the topic of conversation? Oh, yes. Yes. It, People were well aware throughout the United States and the other tribes too. There was, uh, uh, we were members of the National Congress of American Indians and they took a strong stand on this very issue. And I think um, something good that did come out from this was the fact that we, re we received a sizable amount of money uh, if the political political climate were different than was different, then we might have received a lot more. But as I say, the chairman of the Senate committee was was anti-Indian, as were uh, several others on the committee. In the House, it was a different story. We had the backing of John Saylor, who was the ranking Republican on that committee, and and James Haley, who was the chairman of the committee, and they tried to do uh, for us. What what the Senate had undone, and did that money help to relocate the families, the 145 families? Where did that money go? We we found two two new air. We didn't find them. They'd been there all the time, but they were above the floodplain, above the residual area, and. Uh, You don't have to mention that. <laughs> okay. Just a couple more, George. You're okay, Mike? Um, George, how do you feel today about what happened at the Kinsua Dam 50 years ago? Well, at my age, and, and I, I still feel the same way. But the feeling has changed among the younger Senecas. They, they seem. That's because they weren't aware of the way we lived at one time and, and our feeling for the land. Uh, they, they have a different feeling. Of course, uh, I don't know whether our blood quantum has anything to do with it. Uh, through the years, uh, our children have gone to the Salamanca schools and they've, you know, Dan Cupid's there too, and, and that's what happens. Uh, they intermarried and and uh, our blood quantum continues to shrink. Uh, it gets assimilated into the culture. Yes. 
Maybe you could describe a little bit um, what your feelings were back then um, about taking the land. Maybe you could touch on that one more time, like what you felt, if, if you can you know, remember, like what they were doing to you know, the Seneca Indians back then. What were you feeling? Well, like I say, we should have been inured to what they had done to us in the past and what, what they were continuing to do, but uh, like I said, the older ones had utmost faith in the Canandaigua Treaty, and, and uh, it changed their feelings after that, that the federal government was a first-class bunch of stinkers. And <laughs> Your land was taken, and your you know occupations were taken. Fishing, or what? What, what were the residents doing down there? Well, it, it did away with us as farmers. There were uh, there were a number of farmers that had dairy farms, and and everybody had had gardens. We planted our own corn and beans and and squash. The the, the three sisters, as they call them, in, among the Senecas, and and. They all had livestock, uh, but uh, it washed that out completely. Uh, you can't have a farm in the new communities where we had to had to relocate. There just wasn't the room. You you could plant a little garden, but you you couldn't have pigs or or a milk cow or something like that. That was taken away. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the challenges for the Seneca Indians today are, speaking in general terms? What kind of challenge does Lana's little girl have, or Moe's you know, children? Well, I guess uh, one, of the, one of the biggest threats is uh, a loss of our language. There's no saying among the Indians, when you lose your tongue, you lose your Indian. <laughs> you're, not, you're not Indian anymore. So th this is this is one of the biggest threats, and 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 uh, I think that television set is, has a lot to do with uh, what's happening. It's, it's changed it's changed my life. Uh, <laughs> uh, Everybody. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you real quick. <laughs> ah! um, George, you know about the site that they're doing an archaeological dig on? Do you believe there's a connection between the modern Senecas and the people that lived on that site hundreds of years ago? I believe the Senecas and, and the other Iroquois tribes migrated to the east from, from the west coast. Uh, some of the earthenware that they brought with them uh, came from minerals that in the Midwest in Arizona and that we came across the continent and finally we got to the Great Lakes and couldn't go across them or something and so we we settled there. So you feel uh, a connection to that site that's in Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania? You feel a connection there? I, I think, I don't think they were Iroquois and uh, I, I don't know when they started classifying us as Iroquois but uh, I really don't know what. Okay, I've got another one before it starts raining. Um, actually, two more. Why is it important to discover items from the past? Doing the archaeological dig, they're finding different bases. Why is it important to discover those things? Well, <laughs> you feel it's important. <laughs> it's as, as important as finding the first man and was in Java. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last one. Before it starts raining, what does it mean to be Seneca, George? To me, I'm a special person. <laughs> I mean, you're you're not the you're not white, you're not colored, you're you you're your own race. Uh, you you've got a lot of different. You've got the Swedes, you've got the Polish. They're all one race, but well, we had different tribes too, but we're all Indian. Hey, I mm. Thank <laughs> you.